Elon Musk went from being bullied as a child in South Africa and once being hospitalized after a group of boys threw him down a flight of stairs to becoming the richest person in the world with an estimated net worth of $243 billion. Here's my take on this top 10 rules of success. Enjoy. What would you say to young people that want to change the world, that have big ideas? What advice could you give? Uh, I would say, go, you know, go do it. Um, you know, just, just go out there and, and, and do it. Um, the, I mean, the biggest thing I think people uh, fail to do is that they, they, they're, they're too afraid to try things. You know, mm -hmm. that they shouldn't be afraid of, of, of failing and, and they should just go, go and do it. Did you fail at anything that you tried? I've, I've lost, I mean, I've not lost a war, but I've lost battles, certainly. Mm -hmm. I mean, the first three um, flights of, of the Falcon 1 rocket, uh, they crashed. So. Wow, that must have been a big bummer. Yeah, it was a big bummer. Did you cry? No. Rule number two, be optimistic. I'm generally of the view, philosophically, philosophically that it's better to be optimistic and wrong occasionally than pessimistic and right. Um, you know, uh, you go, I think you want to look on the bright, th bright side of things, and um, and I'm a little worried that um, uh, young people today maybe sometimes are a little pessimistic about the future. But like I, I, I'd like to just assure people that so long as we are not complacent, we will solve the climate cri we'll solve the climate crisis, and we will solve these issues. Um, we obviously need to take them seriously and work hard to solve them. They will be solved. Um, and that people should be optimistic about the future and, and work to make that uh, optimistic future real. You know, they say that the best way to predict the future is to create it. Um, and so if you take the actions necessary for there to be a good future, then we will have a good future. Um, and um, so I'd encourage people to be optimistic take the actions that will create a good future, and we will have one. Rule number three, read more and talk to smart people. I know you're a huge reader, um, but from a, um, a lifelong learning perspective, constantly trying to add to your toolkit so that you're you know, a better leader, a better CEO, are there recommendations that you have for the audience about those kinds of things that you do to keep yourself mentally sharp? Well, I read a lot less these days than I used to. When I was a kid, I was read all the time. Um, I mean, I mostly subscribe to scientific periodicals. Like, um, you know, like the, the daily news I find to be a lot of noise um, and just very negative. Uh, so I generally try to not read the daily news all that much. Um, because generally newspapers try to seem to be trying to answer the question, what is the worst thing that happened on Earth today? Uh, <laughs> it was big, okay. There's a lot of people. Something terrible happened every single day, guaranteed. It was just a big, big plan. Also, something great happened, but they don't answer that question. Um, so the, that's, the daily news just tends to make one measurable. But I think like the um, science, science and tech, technology periodicals are quite uh, interesting um, and usually you know if, they, if there's something some new discovery it'll be in, in there um, so and you know I find Twitter enlightening at times you know uh, you learn, learn a bit there um, and, and the talking to smart people uh, all the time uh, is very helpful because um, that, that can be a distillation of of, of interesting things that are going on. Um, and, and, you know, certainly like try to ask people like for the car, like what are we doing wrong? You know, what can we fix? What, we, what can we make better? And they usually just want to tell me, oh, it's great, you know, I love it. And like, but sure, I understand, but what's wrong with it? And like, what can we make better? You know, this is this yeah. theory of like, how do we be less wrong? Rule number four, push through hardships. Starting a company is, is a very tough thing. Um, there's a friend of mine, Bully, who's, whose phrase is, uh, you know, starting a company is like um, staring into the abyss and, and eating glass. Um, so uh, you should certainly expect that it is going to be very hard. Um, it's going to be harder than getting a job somewhere uh, by, by a pretty good margin. Um, and 
um, the, the odds of you losing the money that you've invested or your friends have invested is, is pretty high. I mean, that's just, those are just the basic facts. Um, so uh, if, if you don't mind things being really hard and, and, and high risk, then uh, starting a company is, is a good idea. Otherwise, it's, it's probably unwise. Uh, and will certainly stress you out. <laughs> um, so I think you have to be pretty, pretty driven to make it happen. Um, otherwise, you will just make yourself miserable. Um, and then, and then, and then in, in creating a company, as I said a moment ago, it's just uh, you just want to really say, how, how do you make the best product or service possible? Um, you know, companies that don't make good products or service, services just shouldn't exist. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free, there's a link in the description below. Go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business. I'll see you there. Rule number five, be excited about the future. This is not about like trying to enrich myself. Um, I do not live a life of cons conspicuous consumption. Um, I work, you know, very long hours, and but I think I think what Tesla's doing is important to the future, um, and that's that's why I keep doing it. Um, and I think you know it's it's something that I think is uh, inc Tesla increases the probability that the future will be good for humanity, and and then for SpaceX, um, I think I think uh, it's important that we take the actions like, like that we become a space-faring civilization and a multi-planet species. This is an exciting, inspiring future. You know, you need to have things that, when you wake up in the morning, you're like you're excited about the future. Why live if, if it's all about solving problems or being miserable? Like, why live? Um, so there got to be things that are that are inspiring that like you know get you in the heart. And I think space is one of those things. So you know, look at the Apollo program and you know sending sending people to the moon in '69. And wasn't that a great thing for all of humanity? Great thing. And if you ask people, like, what are some, what are some of the greatest things that humanity has ever done, that would be one of them. Rule number six, learn at every opportunity. I think you really want to try to learn at every opportunity. And, um, you know, it's, it's great to um, read books and talk to interesting people and uh, learn as much as possible. Um, and, um, you know, I suppose it was, uh, I don't know, Plato or someone who said, um, or maybe attributed to Socrates, um, if I, if I know anything, it's that I know nothing. Um, and so essentially, uh, just taking the attitude that, um, really, we, we wish to be less foolish over time, <laughs> um, but it, I think it's actually, if, I'm like, if you accept the premise that you're a fool, <laughs> then we are all to a fool to some degree, then I think that, and you wish to be less foolish, then uh, that's like, I think that's a good approach, you know? And, um, and this, this avoids, this, that maximizes your feedback loop and, and your ability to learn. Um, as soon as you start thinking you know too much, and people can't teach, teach you things, that's when you start getting very dumb. <laughs> um, so uh, I, yeah, I always try to learn learn new things and um, and and being able to talk to interesting people and and you can often learn more by the questions that are asked than the answers that are given. Rule number seven: Have a sense of humor. I mean, generally, I think we should be aiming for like a, a positive society and. Uh, you know that it should be okay to, you know, be humorous. Uh, like, you know, like we should, we should, like, like wokeness basically wants to make comedy illegal. 
which is not cool. We've experienced a bit of that. <laughs> I mean, Ch Chappelle, like what the- Flower bed. <laughs> I mean, try to shut down Chappelle, come on, man, that's crazy. Um, so, um, you know, so do, do we want a humorless society that is, is simply rife with condemnation uh, and hate, basically? Uh, and no forgiveness, right? Yeah. Mm. The, at, at its heart, wokeness is divisive, um, exclusionary, um, and hateful. It's, it's, it basically gives mean people a reason, a, 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 it gives them a shield to be, to be mean and cruel, mm. armored in false virtue. Rule number eight, don't be scared of aging. You've been poking fun at people for their age quite a bit. And I wanted to have a sense of, do you not plan to age? How are, how are you combating aging? Is there some secret technology we don't know about that you are got? I am not aware of any secret technology to combat aging. I don't know that we should really try to live for a super long time. It is important for us to die because most of the times people don't change their mind, they just die. If we live forever, then we might become a very ossified society where new ideas cannot succeed. But I'm not, I'm not poking fun at aging. I'm just saying, you know, if, if we've got people in very important positions that have to make decisions that are critical to the security of the country, then they need to have sufficient presence of mind and cognitive ability to, to make those decisions well, because the whole country is depending on them. Well, I thought you might say psychedelics were your, your, your way of, of not aging, but... Um... I don't think propping acid makes you age less. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> I think drugs probably make you age more, not less. Rule number nine, always keep an open mind. We're wondering if you could do us a quick solid and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. <laughs> On Real the quick. show. <laughs> um, Personal Lord and Savior. You know, it's a quick prayer. Uh, <laughs> 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 I mean, let's just say, like, I agree with the principles that Jesus advocated. Um, and th that the, you know, there's some, some, there's great wisdom in what, in, in the te teachings of, of Jesus. Uh, and I agree with those teachings. Um, and things like turn the other cheek are, are very important because as opposed to an eye for an eye. Um, an eye for an eye leads everyone blind. So, Forgiveness, you know, is important, and um, treating people as you would wish to be treated. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Very important. So it's like a 60, 70 percent? As, yes. <laughs> as Einstein would say, I believe in the God of Spinoza. Um, so, um, but hey, if, um, you know, if, if, if Jesus is, is uh, saving people, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't stand in his way. You know, like, I'll be sure. I'll be saved. Why not? Annual number 10, the last one before some very special bonus clips, is have fun. What's going on with you and Twitter? I am a Twitter addict. I say the wrong things all the time. What is it? Someone explained it to me. I was very close to you, saying it's your release valve. This is where you feel better. Yeah, I think I said some people... It's happy some, place. some people use their hair to express themselves, I use Twitter. Do you regret any of it or not? You are kind of prominent. Yeah, I mean, sure. I mean, Walk us through when you decide to do a, a tweet. You go, no, 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 Well, yes. I, I think about it for hours. Do you? And I consult with my strategy team. <laughs> <laughs> you, you just literally go, yeah. Yeah. Or maybe I'm wasted on that. I've gone. <laughs> <laughs> let me shoot myself in the foot. Bam. Now let me shoot myself in the foot. Bam. Yeah. That describes some of my tweets. Yeah. <laughs> Our primary goal is, is to create the technology necessary to get people to Mars, in the absence of which, you know, it's somewhat academic. Um, so we don't want to get too distracted from our primary mission of we, we, we got to make it at least possible to go to, go to Mars. Um, and we, we want to uh, do so as soon as possible um, and make uh, access to Mars as widely available as, 
as possible, as affordable as possible, so that if somebody wants to go, they can. Um, so that, that's that's our primary mission. Um, I mean, there are many good causes in the world, but we, we've got to be careful that we do not try to um, take on too many. Uh, I mean, there there are many noble missions, but we 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 have to pick our battles and say, okay, let's just make sure we we get this done, um, and. Uh, because nobody else is doing it. And uh, I mean, if, if, uh, if SpaceX doesn't do it, I'm not sure how, how it will happen. I think this, this is, uh, at least right now, SpaceX is uh, the only hope. So we, we've got to get this done. And it's far from done. I mean, it's, we've got a lot, lot, long way to go. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I, Starlink, in terms of providing internet, internet connectivity to uh, people that really don't have it or it's very expensive, I think will be helpful in um, empowering a lot of people who are disempowered today. So I think that's a good thing too. I mean, I'm generally of the view, philosophically, philosophically that it's better to be optimistic and wrong occasionally than pessimistic and right. Um, you know, uh, I think you want to look on the bright, th bright side of things. And, um, and I'm a little worried that um, uh, young people today maybe sometimes are a little pessimistic about the future, but I, like I, I like to just assure people that so long as we are not complacent, we will solve the climate we'll solve the climate crisis, and we will solve these issues. Um, we obviously need to take them seriously and work hard to solve them. They will be solved, um, and that people should be optimistic about the future and and work to make that uh, optimistic future real. You know, they say that the best way to predict the future is to create it. Um, and so if you take the actions necessary for there to be a good future, then we will have a good future. Um, and um, so I'd encourage people to be optimistic, take the actions that will create a good future, and we will have one. What was going through your mind? How, how amazed were you to see your roadster up there with Starman uh, just cruising along with the Blue Planet? And how long will we be getting live views, do you think, from the car? Well, I think it looks so ridiculous and impossible. Um, and you can tell it's real because it looks so fake, honestly. <laughs> like, we'd have way better CGI if it was fake. Um, and you know the, the the colors all look look kind of weird in space. There's no atmospheric occlusion. You know, you know, like everything looks too crisp. Um, and um, but we you know we didn't really test any of those materials for you know is it space hardened or whatever you know. So it just has the same seats that like a normal car has. It's just literally a normal car in space, which I kind of like the absurdity of that. Um, and if you look closely, there's a, on the dashboard, there's a tiny roadster with a tiny spaceman. <laughs> so, because Hot Wheels made a Hot Wheels roadster, and a, and a friend of mine uh, um, suggested, hey, why don't you put that Hot Wheels roadster with a tiny spaceman on the, you know, in the car too? I'm like, that'd be cool. Sure. <laughs> so we did that. Um, I mean, it's kind of silly and fun, but I, I think. I think that's, you know, silly fun things are important. Um, and <laughs> normally for a new rocket, you know, they'd launch like a block of concrete or something like that. I mean, that's so boring. <laughs> um, and uh, I think that's just the imagery of it is something that's going to get people excited around the world. Um, and it's, it's still tripping me out. I mean, I'm tripping balls here. I think AI safety is a really big deal, um, and we should have some regulatory agency that is overseeing uh, AI safety. Um, um, but there is not yet currently any such thing, and, and just any, generally any kind of regulatory agency done by the government will usually takes years to put in place. Um, so. Um, you know, after uh, the population collapse issue, I think AI safety is probably the second biggest um, threat to the future of civilization. Um, and um, yeah, like I said, I'm not quite sure what to do with it. Um, 
it, I mean, Tesla is arguably the, the world's biggest robot maker because like, we have basically semi, semi-autonomous cars that will ultimately be fully autonomous. Um, and we are building a humanoid robot that will be basically like, um, like, like the car but with legs. Um, so, um, and I, I kind of uh, held off on doing that for a while because, you know, I, was, I, I certainly don't want to hasten the AI apocalypse. But clearly, with the, if you look at Boston Dynamics, and, and like those humanoid robots are going to happen. So, um, they're either going to happen with or without Tesla. So, it's like Tesla got a little bit more, I mean, a lot more ability to ensure uh, robotics safety and AI. Um, and I'll try my best to, to do that. My question is about failure. So I was just wondering what are you trying at the moment or what do you think you'll attempt in the future that you're not expecting to succeed at? <laughs> well, I, I, think, I think I'm gonna stay on, on um, electric cars and, and rockets for a while. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it was actually never, never my intent to, to run Tesla, I, I, I kind of, because running two companies is quite, quite a burden, actually. Um, <laughs> um, I, I, you know, it, it's, sometimes I run into people who, who, who think, oh, if you're CEO of the company, then they, then they sort of imagine themselves, if they were CEO of the company, they would grant themselves lots of vacation um, and do lots of fun things. And it's like, that doesn't work quite work, work that way. <laughs> um, what you actually get is a distillation of the, the, the worst things going on in the company. <laughs> it's like, um, and uh, anyway, so I, 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 that, the idea of taking on something more is, uh, is, is very frightening. Um, but uh, I mean, possibly at some point in the future, certainly not the near term, there are, uh, I, I think there's, there's an, um, an opportunity to create um, an, an electric jet, essentially, um, and, I, and I do think one could create an electric jet that, that um, is really exciting, something that would be supersonic, vertical takeoff and landing, pure electric, um, and just, just a, big, a big leap forward. Um, I, think, I think that's, that's a distinct, I, I, I'm, I'm quite confident it's doable, um, provided that there is a, uh, a rough doubling of the energy density um, in, in batteries or capacitors, so, or, you know, basically around, around the 500 watt hours per kilogram level is where it starts to make sense. Um, and then there's, um, I, I do think there's the possibility of kind of a, a fifth mode of transport, uh, which I've talked about, kind of mentioned tangentially, uh, which is, uh, like I, 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 I call kind of the, the hyperloop, with, um, and, um, you know, I'd, I, I, I'd like to sort of publish something about that maybe in the next month or two, um, once Tesla's at steady state production. Um, and, and I want to flesh it out a little bit to, so that, um, and, and, and pre-address some of the rebuttals that people will come up with, um, rather than just sort of put it out there and, and then happy have the rebuttal occur and, and, and have an unaddressed rebuttal. Um, but um, I guess the way to think of it is um, it's like a cross between uh, a Concord and a railgun. Suppose to be 20 years old right now, where would you start your path from? I mean, if I was literally just, so if I was just a 20 year old right now in 2021, Correct. if I was 21 in 2021, <laughs> From where would you um, start? Um, hmm. Well, I, I mean, assuming that I'm still a technologist, then I think there's um, a lot of opportunity in synthetic uh, RNA. Um, the you know the vaccines that were developed apart from you know, the the, like the, one, the ones that were done by BioNTech and um, Moderna um, are really the beginning of what I call digital medicine, or medicine and software. And I think that's, I would say, what's the single biggest opportunity I see right now? It's probably um, synthetic RNA, 
um, and uh, the potential for revolutionizing medicine in that way. Um, there's also artificial intelligence. Um, there's one of my favorites that, which is tunnels. <laughs> Um, we need a lot of tunnels to address the traffic in, in major cities. Um, and then there's obviously the, the continued electrification of transport uh, with aircraft and boats, um, in addition to cars. Um, let's see. There's many other things that will come up as well. So I, I think we live at a very exciting time. In, uh, you know, if you look at the whole history of the world and you know, humanity, this is a time of the greatest technological growth in history. Um, and it seems to be accelerating. There was a bunch of uh, very misleading stuff that was published uh, by ProPublica. Um, and really that was some sort of was trickery and... Uh, Really, they, they did themselves no good service by by, by doing that. Um, uh, so first of all, with respect to the government contracts that, that uh, SpaceX wins, uh, our aspiration is to do the most for the least. And if you look at all the contracts we've won, um, we've won them because we have the best price. We have a better service at a lower price. They weren't just handed to us. No, I don't think um, they were. And that's what I'm saying. In fact, you called me and said we finally got in after years of sort yeah. of this back slappy. I think it's a great thing. That is yeah, a great thing. Absolutely. I mean, in, in the, for the Lunar Lander, just taking that as one example, um, uh, our bid was half the price of the Blue Origin uh, Lockheed uh, bid. Half. So for, for, for a vehicle that does basically 10 times more or eight times more perhaps, um, our, our price was half. Okay. And NASA has a mandate to get back to the moon. so we save taxpayers like $3 billion relative to that contract. Um, so I think that's, that's a good thing. There's sometimes a debate about going to Mars one way um, and whether that makes things easier. And I think for the initial flights perhaps, but for long term to get the cost down, you need the spacecraft back. Whether the people come back is irrelevant. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, but, but you must have the ship back because uh, those, those things are expensive. So, so anyone who wants to return can just jump on. Um, so that, that, that's, but, but until a few years ago, I wasn't sure that success was one of the possible outcomes. And now I, now I think, now I'm quite sure that success is possible. Of course, there's a long way between possible and making it real, but I, I believe it is possible. The source of my inspiration, I'd say, is um, somewhat philosophical. Um, the, um, so I think that, that, that the, <clears throat> Uh, the thing we should be aiming for is uh, increasing the scope and scale of human civilization um, so as to best uh, ask the, the right questions for the answer which is reality um, or the universe. Um, and so if you accept that uh, premise, then, then we should work to ensure the long-term survival and prosperity of humanity, uh, of consciousness, and we should uh, seek to extend that consciousness beyond Earth to other planets, eventually other star systems. Um, that is uh, the nature of my philosophy. He did one great tweet about time, saying time is the uh, currency, which I thought was beautiful. Time is the ultimate currency, yes. Um, no matter what resources you have, you can't wind back the clock. It's true. Yeah. Going into the future, our goal with Tesla is to uh, keep refining the technology, increasing the scale of production, um, and, um, and, and make a mass market electric car uh, that, that, that almost anyone can afford. Um, that's, we're, that, that's step three on the strategy. Yeah, so step one was, was um, a high price, low volume. Step two, mid price, mid volume. Step three, low price, high volume. So we've sort of at step two, and now we, we want to progress to, to step three as, as soon as possible. There's another important principle, which is that um, you really want uh, everyone to be chief engineer. 
So that everyone is chief engineer means that people need to understand the, the system at a high level, to know uh, what they, uh, when they are making a, a, a bad optimization. Uh, it's like, like when they are, uh, like, uh, say, like this, we've done this many times, where we've like put immense effort into reducing the uh, engine mass, but not, uh, but hardly any effort into reducing uh, propellant residuals, or, or like order of magnitude less effort into uh, reducing propellant residuals, and then you end, you, you land with a literal ton of unused fuel. What is the one thing that has surprised you about your life? Oh, one thing, wow. Well, I certainly, I'm surprised by the whole thing, honestly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I certainly didn't expect to be, to be uh, for any of these things to happen, honestly. Um, yeah. I, I just, you know, <laughs> I knew I wanted to be involved in technology. Um, and, uh, in fact, the only reason I started a company back in 95, an internet company, was because I couldn't get it. There were only a few internet companies, and I couldn't get a job at any of them. <laughs> so they, <laughs> Um, I tried to get a job at, at Netscape um, and uh, sent my resume in and tried hanging out in the lobby, but I was too shy to talk to anyone. And, uh, and then I was like, okay, well, I guess I'll have to start a company because I can't get a job anywhere. Here's another question um, from a Tesla owner. Why is there no coat hook in the back? Yeah. <laughs> he says, he or she says, you can design a rocket, but you forgot the coat hooks? Well, I didn't actually forget it. I just I intentionally didn't like it, so I didn't put it there. Um, like the aesthetics of it really bothered me. But um, and I know, you know, obviously, some people disagree with that decision. Um, but I think I think we might have um, a, a retroactive fix for that if somebody has the panoramic roof, uh, which is to to basically ha have a hook on the the, the bow section in, in the middle of the roof. Um, and then, the, then the, your, your coat could hang down in the second row passenger foot well, which is actually slightly better than having a coat hook uh, that's stuck on the side of the car. Um, so I, I, I think we'll probably do that. Um, yeah. It sure is important to get the, the rules right. Um, and, um, you know, it's sort of, uh, in, in terms of legislative and executive actions, um, you know, it's sort of like, um, you know, if you think of, say, like professional sports or something. If you, if you don't have the rules right, if there isn't, uh, uh, you know, um, if, it, if, it, if, it, if, the, if the game isn't set up properly, it's not going to be a, a good game. Um, so it's real important to get the, rule, the rules right. Um, now, I think it's, it's worth noting that I think still, um, in the United States, the rules are still better than anywhere else. Um, um, but um, the, you know, it, it's, it's very easy to put something in place which is an inhibitor to, to innovation without realizing it. Um, so in terms of um, the regulatory environment, uh, uh, it's, it's always important to bear in mind that uh, regulations uh, are immortal um, and they, 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 they never die unless somebody Act, actually goes and kills them, and then they, they get a lot of momentum. So a lot of times regulations can be put in place for, for all the right reasons, um, but then nobody goes back and gets rid of them afterwards when they no longer make sense. Um, you know, the, uh, and there used to be a rule in the early days when people were concerned about automobiles, because that was a pretty scary thing, see a carriage just going wrong by itself. Mm -hmm. You know, you never know what those things might do. Um, so there were like rules where you had to in a lot of states, we had to carry a lantern in front of the automobile. Um, and it had to be like 100 paces ahead of the automobile. There had to be someone with a lantern on a pole. <laughs> I'm like, OK. But you really get rid of that regulation. And they did, you know. Because um, <laughs> it would really be awkward. Um, so, um, so just regulations, even if done correctly and, for, and, and being right at the time, it's always important to go back and, and scrub those you know, periodically to make sure they're still sensible and they're still serving the greater good. The proposed Mars expedition, um, what, how exactly do you plan on making it cost efficient? Sure. Um, well, no, that is, that is indeed a tricky problem. Um, 
I mean, I feel reasonably possible that, um, th that success is at least one of the possible outcomes. Um, <laughs> it, uh, like, the, this is a, I mean, this is pretty important when you're trying to do something. It's like, well, it can, can that be one of the out outcomes? I wasn't actually uh, confident about that until a few years ago. Um, now, I'm not saying we will get there, but I, 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 I'm confident that it is at least possible. Um, and the, the key to that is having a fully reusable Mars transportation system so that all you're, all you're placing between flights, maybe apart from minor maintenance, is the propellant. Um, I mean, this is uh, this like the reusability is so fundamental to uh, to having a, 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 st a, a major change in space flight. It's, it would be difficult to overstate its importance. Um, it, but I mean, I think it, with analogy to other modes of transport, you can imagine that if airplanes could only be used once, um, they would very few people would fly. Because um, it would be super crazy expensive. Um, you know, I guess like a 747 costs a quarter billion dollars. You'd need two of them just for a round trip. Uh, but people are not paying half a billion dollars to fly back and forth to London. Um, and that's because you can use a 747 like 20,000 times. Um, and for a rocket, you know, a Falcon 9 rocket uh, costs about $60 million to build. And so if it can be used once, obviously that's a $60 million capital cost. But if it can be used a thousand times, then it's only a sixty thousand dollar capital cost. Um, and I mean that is, you know, it's a, it is it is the fundamental difference. So you have to have fully reusable. Then you, you have to make sure that the propellant used is uh, as low cost as possible. So our next generation rockets will be using methane as a fuel, which methane is the is the lowest cost source fuel on the planet. Um, by, by a good margin, so, uh, and, and so I, I think if, you, if, if your propellant costs are low and the system is fully reusable, th then I think it, it, I think it should be possible to, it should, to, to move to Mars for less than half a million dollars, which I think is, is an important threshold because if people can sell all this stuff on Earth and move to Mars, well, uh, and there's enough people who, who can do that um, combined with those who actually want to do that. Uh, <laughs> then then, then you, that, that's, that's the, the fundamental thing needed to uh, have a, a growing colony on Mars. I mean, kind of like the way that the U.S. was, like the early uh, English colonies in America. Um, you know, when it became affordable for people to sell all this stuff in England and um, moved to America, it grew really fast. Um, in the absence of that, it's, it, it would just require humongous amounts of government support, and, and I think probably wouldn't be, wouldn't result in a self-sustaining civilization. So th the economics of it are extremely fundamental. After that third trip, I, 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 I'd learned a lot more about rockets at that point, um, and I, I held a, a series of meetings, um, just, just sort of brainstorming sessions, with people from the, the space industry to try to understand if, there was, if, if I was missing something fundamental about um, the ability to improve rocketry. Um, and, and this is where I think it's helpful to use the approach, yeah, the, the, the analytical approach in physics, which is to try to boil things down to first principles and, and reason from there as opposed to reasoning by analogy. Um, so, uh, and, and the way this applied to interrogatory was to say, okay, well, um, what, are the, what are the materials that, that go into a rocket? Um, how, you know, how much does each material constituent uh, weigh? Um, what's the cost of that raw material? And, and, that, and that's going to set some floor um, as, as to the cost of the rocket. Uh, and, and that actually turns out to be a relatively small number. Um, certainly, um, well under 5% of the cost of a rocket, and in some cases closer to 1% or 2%. Um, and so I call it sort of maybe the, the, the magic wand number. So if, if, you, if you had a pile of, 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 of the raw material, piles of raw materials on the floor, and you could just wave a magic wand 
rearrange them, um, then, then that would be the, the, the best case scenario for, for a rocket. And so I was able to see, okay, well, there's clearly a great deal of room for improvement, e even if you consider rockets to be expendable. Um, and and so, so I think that's, that's sort of, that's what I mean by sort of thinking about things from a first principle standpoint. If, if on the ha other hand, I sort of analyzed it by analogy and said, okay, well, analogy would be, well, what are all other rocket companies, what, what do their rockets cost? What historically have, have other rockets cost? And that would be sort of an analogy thing, but it really doesn't illustrate what the true potential is. Um, and, and so I, I think it's sort of a, a first principle uh, first principles approach is, is, is a good way to, um, to understand w what new things are possible. That, so this, this is a good, a good framework. How do we figure out how to, how to take you to Mars um, and, and, and create a, a self-sustaining city, a, a city that um, is not merely an outpost but can become a planet in its own right um, and for us, thus we could become a truly multi-planet species? Uh, there, there, you know, sometimes people wonder, well, what about other places in the solar system? Why, why Mars? Um, well, um, just to sort of put things into perspective, this is, this, is what, this is an actual scale of what the solar system looks like. So we're, we're currently in the, the third little rock from the left. Uh, that's Earth. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. The, and, and our goal is to go to the fourth rock on the left. Uh, that's Mars. Um, but you can get a sense for the real scale of the solar system, how big the sun is, of Jupiter, um, Neptune, uh, Saturn, Uranus, and then the little guys on, on the right are Pluto and friends. This, this sort of uh, helps see it not, not quite to scale, but it gives you a better sense for, for where things are. Uh, so our options for, for, going to, for, for becoming a multi-planet species within our solar system are, uh, are limited. Uh, we have, uh, in terms of nearby options, we've, we've got Venus, uh, but Venus is a high pressure, a su super high pressure hot acid bath. Um, so that, that would be a tricky one. Uh, Venus is not at all like um, the, the, the goddess. This is not in no way similar to, to, to the actual goddess. Um, so uh, it's really difficult to make things work on Venus. Uh, Mercury is also way too close to the sun. Um, we could go potentially on the, Mar one, of the, on the one of the moons of Jupiter or Saturn, but those are quite far out, much further from the sun, a lot harder to get to. It really leaves us with one option if we want to become a multi-planet civilization, and that's, that's Mars. Uh, we could conceivably go to our moon, um, and I certainly have nothing against going to the moon, but I think it's, it's challenging to create a, uh, a become multi-planetary on the moon because it's, it's much smaller than than a planet, uh, it doesn't have any atmosphere, it, it's not as resource rich as Mars, um, it's got a 28 day day, whereas the Mars day is 24 and a half hours, um, and it, in general Mars is, is far better suited to ultimately scale up to be a self-sustaining civilization. When you hire people, or really what you're trying to, when you hire people, that just means you're convincing people to join you in, in the endeavor, um, you should hire people uh, that are that also passionate about what you're doing, so it's not just that they're not just there for the salary. Um, they, they really need to care about what, what they're doing, and and then then they will stay during the dark times. After that third trip, I I I'd, I'd learned a lot more about rockets at that point, um, and I, I held a, a series of meetings, um, just just sort of brainstorming sessions with people from. The, the space industry to try to understand if there was if, if I was missing something fundamental about um, the ability to improve rocketry, um, and, and this is where I think it's helpful to use the approach, yeah, the, the, the analytical approach in physics, which is to try to boil things down to first principles and, and reason from there, as opposed to reasoning by analogy. Um, so, uh, and and the way this applied to, to rocketry was. To say, okay, well, um, what are the what are the materials that, that go into a rocket? Um, how you know how much does each material constituent uh, weigh? Um, what's the cost of that raw material? And and that and that's going to set some floor um, as as to the cost of the rocket. 
Uh, and, and that actually turns out to be a relatively small number. Um, certainly, um, well under 5% of the cost of a rocket, and in some cases, closer to 1% or 2%. Um, and so, I call it sort of maybe the, the, the magic wand number. So if, if, you, if you had a pile of, 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 of the raw material, piles of raw materials on the floor, and you could just wave a magic wand and rearrange them, um, then, then that would be the, 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 the best case scenario for, for a rocket. And so I was able to see, okay, well, there's clearly a great deal of room for improvement, e even if you consider rockets to be expendable. Um, and and so, so I think that's, that's sort of, that's what I mean by sort of thinking about things from a first principle standpoint. If, if on the ha other hand, I sort of analyzed it by analogy and said, okay, well, analogy would be, well, what are all other rocket companies, what, what do their rockets cost? What historically have, have other rockets cost? And that would be sort of an analogy thing, but it really doesn't illustrate what the true potential is. Um, and, and so I, I think a sort of a first principle, a pr first principles approach is, is, is a good way to, um, to understand w what new things are possible. That, so this, this is a good, a good framework. Why do you think Tesla succeeded whereas other car companies failed in their methods of, electric, of electric cars? Like why do you think Tesla is the leader in this idea? Well, um, I mean, there haven't been that many car company startups. Uh, I mean, there, were, there was the sort of Fisker uh, and Coda, um, and, and then a, a few smaller ones, um, and, and then the rest has sort of been some, some fairly small-scale efforts by the big companies. Um, uh, I, I, I think. It, if, if we say, what was the difference between, say, Fisker and Tesla, that's maybe the bit most direct comparison. Uh, it, Tesla is a hardcore engineering company, and Fisker is kind of a, was based on, kind of on styling. You know, it's like, styling is good, important, but it's, that's not the reason we don't have electric cars. So, it's not, you know, but for styling, we, we would have electric cars. That's not the reason. Um, so, in the case of Fisker, they made a car that uh, a lot of people think looked really good, but didn't work properly. So it, then people don't want to buy the car. Um, that's like a pretty reasonable thing, I think. Um, uh, yeah. Um, I, yeah. I mean, if you think of like, like what, what, what's the point of a company existing? The, the point is that it, it, it's, it's a group of people that have gathered together to create a product. If the product is good, the company should exist, and if it is not good, the company should not exist. Um, that seems like fundamental to the nature of companies. So the, I mean, clearly then one should focus on making the absolute best product you can, otherwise you reduce the probability of success. But a lot of companies focus on things that aren't really to do with the product. Um, as though a company has any basis for existing apart from doing useful things. That's kind of strange. As you recall, the, the, the recession was particularly difficult for, for car companies. And right as in the summer of 2008, we had to raise a, a big funding round. But because of the collapse in the financial system, that, that funding round didn't, didn't happen. And um, uh, was, we had to piece together the money to keep the company going from, um, ex from myself and existing investors. And we were able to just complete a, to complete a financing round that was just barely enough to keep the company going. And we, we closed it on the last hour of the last day that it was possible to do so. Uh, it, was, uh, it was Christmas Eve, uh, 2000, 2008, 6 p.m. <laughs> and after that, the investors would, would would have had, had, they were going on vacation, wouldn't have been possible to bring them back to the table, and we would have run out of money a few days after Christmas. So that was also a close call. So while things are going really well these days, I think it's always important to remember that uh, when you're creating a company, there are very dark times, and it's about getting through those, those dark times. Um, that, that's the difference uh, between success and failure. The proposed Mars expedition, um what, how exactly do you plan on making it cost-efficient? Sure. Um, 
Well, no, that is, that is indeed a tricky problem. Um, <laughs> I mean, I feel reasonably possible that um, th that success is at least one of the possible outcomes. Um, <laughs> it, uh, like, th this is a, I mean, this is pretty important when you're trying to do something. It's like, well, it can can that be one of the out outcomes? I, I wasn't actually uh, confident about that until a few years ago. Um, now, I'm not saying we will get there, but I, 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 I'm confident that it is at least possible. Um, and the, the key to that is having a fully reusable Mars transportation system so that all you're, all you're placing between flights, maybe for, apart from minor maintenance, is the propellant. Um, I mean, this is, uh, this, like, the reusability is so fundamental to, uh, to having a, 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 a major change in space flight. It's, it would be difficult to overstate its importance. Um, but I mean, I think with analogy to other modes of transport, you can imagine that if airplanes could only be used once, um, they would, very few people would fly, because um, it would be super crazy expensive. Um, you know, I guess like a 747 costs a quarter billion dollars, you'd need two of them just for a round trip. Uh, people are not paying half a billion dollars to fly back and forth to London. Um, and that's because you can use the 747 like 20,000 times. Um, and for a rocket, you know, a Falcon 9 rocket uh, costs about $60 million to build. And so if it can be used once, obviously that's a $60 million capital cost. But if it can be used 1,000 times, then it's only a $60,000 capital cost. Um, I mean, that is... You know, it's a, it is it is the fundamental difference. So you have to have fully reusable. Then you, you have to make sure that the propellant used is uh, as low cost as possible. So our next generation rockets will be using methane as a fuel, which methane is the is the lowest cost source fuel on the planet um, by, by a good margin. So uh, and, and so I, I think if you, if, if your propellant costs are low and the system is fully reusable, then I think it, it, I think it should be possible to, it should, to move to Mars for less than half a million dollars, which I think is, is an important threshold, because if people can sell all this stuff on Earth and move to Mars, well, uh, and there's enough people who, who can do that, um, combined with those who actually want to do that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Then, then, then you, that, that's, that's the, the fundamental thing needed to uh, have a, a growing colony on Mars. I mean, kind of like the way that the U.S. was, like the early uh, English colonies in America. Um, you know, when it became affordable for people to sell all this stuff in England and um, move to America, it grew really fast. Um, in the absence of that, it's, it, it would just require humongous amounts of government support and, and I think probably wouldn't be, wouldn't result in a self-sustaining civilization. So th the economics of it are extremely fundamental. What drives you? What, what is it that when you wake up in the morning, do you see a problem and you want to solve it? Yeah. Uh, I, I think that the, the thing that uh, drives me is that uh, I want to be able to think about the future and uh, you know, feel good about that. Um, so uh, that uh, you know, we're doing what we can to uh, have the future be be as good as possible, um, to be inspired by what is likely to happen, um, and to look forward to the next day. Um, so that's that's what really what really drives me is 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 trying to figure out uh, how do we how to make sure that things are great and. Um, and going to be so, and um, that's the underlying principle behind uh, Tesla and SpaceX. Um, is that um, I think it's, it's it's pretty important that we accelerate the transition to uh, sustainable generation and consumption of energy. Um, it, it's inevitable, but it's it matters if we ha if it happens sooner or later. Um, and then SpaceX is about. Um, helping make life multi-planetary. 
um, and doing what we can to continue the, the dream of Apollo um, and uh, ultimately make a contribution to life becoming multi-planetary. I think, uh, so, so when, you, when you create a company, I mean, if you think, well, what is a company really? A company is a group of people gathered together to create a product or service. And that, that's really all a company is. And so you have to really believe in what you're creating and, and that it's, and, and, and know in your heart and mind that this is something that matters that, and, and, and that uh, the world ought to have. Um, and I think it's important to investors to, to show that, that you're, you're all in. And I think, for example, with, with Tesla, um, the, the fact that I invested all the money I had, literally, literally I had to borrow money from friends to, to pay the rent in, in 2008. Um, uh, the fact, so the fact that I was all in, I think, was hugely, made, made a huge difference to, to the investors um, to convince them to invest in, in, in Tesla uh, at the same time that, that say, GM and Chrysler were, were going bankrupt. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think, I think you, like you have to show that you, you really care. Like, it's, like, you, you know, um, that you've got skin in the game and that if, if you've, you've given it everything that you've got and then the other people at the company uh, will follow the suit, as, as will investors. I think, I think that's really important. Another mistake that tends to happen in production is too much in-process testing. Uh, so, in the, it, when you're first setting up a production line, you don't know where, the, like, where things are, are breaking. You don't know where things are breaking, so you'll test uh, like work in process at various steps. Um, and because you want to isolate where's, where we, where, where, where's the mistake occurring. Um, so a very common mistake, uh, uh, issue with production lines is to have, um, is, is to not remove the in-process testing uh, after you've uh, diagnosed where the problems are. So basically if you have like um, a very high acceptance, if, like, if, if things are getting to end of line testing and, and are passing, uh, then you don't need to do in-process testing. So, uh, but what tends to happen is there'll be an, like an initial like development engineering team that will be like basically debugging the production line, but then they will forget to take out the in-process testing steps. Uh, so then what happens is the in-process tester uh, will often choke the cycle time, uh, choke, choke the line production time, uh, it'll be like the, the limiter. Uh, it'll also have some number of false positives and false negatives. Right. Uh, but I mean, it'll be like false positives, like then you're like re rejecting good parts. Right. Um, so um, really in volume production, if, you have, uh, if things are working well, uh, you're really just taking a risk. Will this part be, re will, will this subsystem be rejected at, uh, dur in the, during the production process or at the end? Um, and so you just really want to move things pretty much, almost always to just test at the end of line and that's it. Um, maybe there's like one or two end process steps that are hard to test at the end of line, but, that, but basically remove almost everything. An important thing in, in uh, innovation or trying to cr create new things is, is, is to try really hard to, to do that, um, which may sound incredibly obvious, but uh, th that's what I find is, is most often what people don't do. They actually didn't, didn't try super hard to come up with something new. Um, and, and it is helpful to have cross-pollination of industries. Um, I mean, it's, it's been quite difficult to run SpaceX and Tesla, but there has been good, good ideas, you know, if I, since I got both in my mind space, this, this good ideas going back and forth. The, um, for example, on the car, with respect to the car, the Model S is the only all aluminum body and chassis car made in North America, and very few cars are, are all aluminum. In the aerospace industry, it's, that, that's the default. Um, so it seemed like, like obviously the right move in order to minimize the, the non-battery pack mass of the car. So in order to offset you know, fairly heavy battery pack, we had to make the rest of the car light, but, but still achieve uh, a five-star safety rating. Um, I don't think it would have been possible to do that if we had used steel, which is the traditional method. Um, and, and what's helped SpaceX has been that the, the car industry is really good at making complicated objects 
at a low cost. I mean, it's actually quite incredible that like, one can buy a, a decent car for $20,000. I mean, all the stuff that's in that car is, I mean, it's, it's nutty how much stuff is in a car. Um, so, uh, at, at SpaceX, uh, I hired a bunch of people from the auto industry to uh, run manufacturing, which has worked out reasonably well. What's the actual biggest failure that, you, that you've gone through to get to where you are? We blew up three rockets in the beginning. <laughs> uh, so, that, was, that, was, that was bad. Uh, okay. We actually only had enough money. For, well, originally, only, uh, for, I, I basically took all, all the money I made from PayPal, put it into SpaceX, or to creating SpaceX, Tesla, and, and SolarCity, and uh, I f initially figured I'd, I'd, just, I'd keep half of it, and then I'd spend the other half on these crazy adventures that would probably fail. Um, and then, unfortunately, they needed all the money. So, <laughs> so I had to give them all the money. And then I didn't have a house or I had to borrow money for rent. That was... That was pretty difficult. That was back in 2008. Um, and then we managed to scrape enough spare parts together to do a fourth launch at SpaceX, um, and that worked. And if it had not worked, SpaceX would have died, probably would have lacked the credibility to raise the remaining money for Tesla, and we wouldn't be here today. Or maybe it'd be like, not this ending. There's a lot of uh, technical problems to solve. Um, so I guess we sort of, you know, started studying kind of engineering and physics and biosciences and that kind of thing would be the um, way to go. Um, yeah, um, a lot of, gonna be a lot of problems to solve to to make a city work on Mars. Um, we were thinking of just as a well, sort of a semi joke, putting a, a job description on our website for uh, urban planner in brackets Mars. Uh, <laughs> um, but um, you know, there's, there's, there's going to be just a tremendous amount of problem to solve. There'll be there's just a lot of building, building and problem solving. So those are like the right, you know, skills to work on if if, if, if someone's interested in going beyond Earth or you know space in general. I think like if, if, if you're like trying to work on something, and like my experience is like it's really hard to like. It, if you're trying to figure out what others love, but you don't love it, it's really hard to make that great. So when you work True. on something, if you fall in love with it, that's, that's a good sign. Um, mm -hmm. And then don't worry about if others do. If, if you do, uh, others will. Whatever requirement or constraint you have, it must come with a name, not a department. Because uh, you can't ask the department, you have to ask a person. Yeah. Uh, and that person who's putting forward the requirement or constraint must agree that they must take responsibility for that requirement. Otherwise, you can have a requirement that basically an intern two years ago randomly came up with off the cuff, uh, and they're not even at the company anymore. Right. Uh, and, 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 but it came from the, let's say, aero loads department. They're like, uh, actually, no one in the aero loads department actually currently agrees with that. Uh, this, right. is now, this is, by the way, happened several times. So again, it can be literally- I don't want to on the aero loads department, but it's like, yeah. it's, it's every department. First of all, I think that's very exciting and inspiring, and there need to be things that are exciting and inspiring and, and uh, make you look forward to waking up in the morning. Like, it's like, yay, the future is exciting. <laughs> this is underappreciated, <laughs> you know, like tunnels. <laughs> 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 sorry. <laughs> it's like, sorry. Um, and, um, you know, but there, there's got to be things that make, make you excited about life. Um, but you know, it can't just be problem solving, you know, one, one sort of miserable problem after another. It's got to be like, I'm fired up about the future, and here's why, you know? And, and space is one of those things that, that does that for people all around the world. Um, you know, when, um, when Apollo 11, you know, when, it, when they landed on the moon, I mean, it was, that was something for all of humanity, it really was, you know? And people would, you know, if there was like one TV for 50 miles around, people would walk you know, they'd walk 50 miles just to go find that one TV to, to watch it happen. Um, so, you know, sometimes people think, well, what about, what about the poor nations of the world? They're like, you know what, it inspire, inspires them too. Um, and, um, you know, we need things like that. Because you made it this far in a video, 
I want to celebrate you. Most people start and don't finish. Most people never actually follow through. Most people say they want something, but they don't ever do the work to actually get it. But you're different. You're special. Believe Nation, you made it here all the way to the end, and I love you. So it's a special celebration if you put a hashtag believe down in the comments below on this video. I will showcase you and celebrate you somewhere on the screen in a future video because you are awesome. For 10 more amazing rules from Elon Musk, check the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. Create the technology necessary to get people to Mars in the absence of which, you know, it's somewhat academic. Um, so we don't want to get too distracted from our primary mission of we, we, we got to make it at least possible